Right, we're back. Episode two um, of a Metaphobia Free Podcasts. Uh, today we're looking at how you yourself, Rob, kind of found your way into the well difficult world of emetophobes um, and right. how you developed the program. Because sort of as I understand it, the research that I've looked into, obviously being an emetophobe and now working within the emetophobic world, is there isn't really that many options out there for an emetophobe looking to overcome their phobia. So it's quite interesting that you've come along and developed, you know, such a game changing program for emetophobes. So I'm just sort of looking to understand or give an opportunity for people listening in to understand how you came into it, a bit of a background on where you've come from, what your previous history was, and why such a specific phobia sort of became such an interest for you to develop a whole program behind it. Okay, good question. So I think uh, t two two main things. First of all, I was already a practicing therapist. And we, we know we know we know that uh, emetophobes uh generally speaking are are very bright people because you've got to be really quite bright to be obsessive. And we know generally speaking that um emetophobes are, are perfectionists and black and white thinkers and uh tend to brood and ruminate a lot and uh we know the vast majority are female so it's not surprising then that there are a lot in a university town okay and cambridge yep, yep. is where i was practicing for 25 30 years is a massive university town and there are several female only colleges there so just really by default of the fact that I was a therapist in a university town with lots of bright females there, I think meant there were lots of emetophobes there. I do remember, I do remember years ago, as far as I could tell, I think I was the first person in the UK to ever advertise the fact that I wanted to work or, or worked with emetophobes. I don't recall ever seeing on another, the word emetophobia ever being on another therapist website of any yes. denomination at the time i was the i was the first one and because of the because the therapy i was, I was already practicing which was you know loosely based on a, on a, on a kind of positive psychology um program i think wasn't hard for me to orientate that when I first created the Thrive program, and then to orientate the Thrive program specifically towards emetophobia. So it's so, so that's three things. I apologise. The second thing, because I just skipped one, is I had a girlfriend very very early on in my therapeutic career that had emetophobia, and in fact, probably right. even before I ever treated a client with it. That's absolutely true. Thinking back, I couldn't remember that. That's absolutely true. I don't think I treated one before I had this girlfriend with emetophobia. And through our conversations during the first six months of our relationship, she overcome her emetophobia. Really, I remember okay. quite specifically the moment we went to a um, we went to a sore doctor's. A soul doctor's gig at uh, Nottingham University, and I remember her saying to me, "Oh my God, we've been here like an hour and a half, and I haven't once had a thought or a doubt or a worry about all these people or about haven't done any of my safety signal behaviours." And it was the first time she'd noticed at that point that her emetophobia had gone. Now we hadn't specifically tried to get her over it. You know, she she was my girlfriend, but we, clearly we talked about it a lot, and I gave her the, the you know the benefit or whatever that was of my therapeutic experience. But yeah, obviously I was already a practicing therapist, and already was in a position where I didn't collude with her phobia, where I gave her helpful suggestions every day, where I helped her challenge her beliefs, challenged her thinking styles. You know, if she was catastrophizing something, I would help her to 
calm that down or she was thinking about something in a black and white way. If she was using language suggesting that she thought she couldn't tolerate something, I'd ask her why. And just gently, you know, pick those beliefs and those thinking styles apart to the point where she got over it. And I'm, I'm, I did a little bit of research then or looked, looked, looked at whatever research was available then, which wasn't very much at all, as you know. And I thought, well, there must be other people with this. You know, I'll let people know that I've helped someone overcome it. And literally, you know, within days of it going on my website, I, I was getting phone calls from everywhere. And that was that was really yeah. it. And and then, you know, I, 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 was, I was very, very busy back then. I saw lots of clients back then. And I think news traveled really fast. So as soon as the... The uh, the counsellors at the university heard that there was someone local that helped them out of phobia. You know, if you think, I don't know, I have no idea how many thousands of students there are in Cambridge at any one time, I would have thought, I don't know. Let's say it's 10,000. must be an awful lot more, but let's say it's 10,000, okay? 50% of those are male, so there's 5,000. And let's say probably... 10% of those might have some kind of eating disorder. I do remember, mm -hmm. I do remember my researcher saying to me that all the girls she knew in the boat cruise had eating disorders. Everyone all she knew, everyone she knew that rode for Cambridge, or not necessarily for Cambridge, but rode for one of the universities, one of the colleges in Cambridge, should I say, had an eating disorder. But they would have to have Joe because not only they were they working, studying at one of the top universities in the country, which already means, you know, a 40 or 50 hour week, I imagine, but they were getting up at four or yeah. five o'clock, five mornings a week to go and row for mm -hmm. two or three hours before they then started their busy work day. Of course, they if they weren't obsessive, and, and had really strong desires for control before they went to university, you're damn sure they would be afterwards. She said they all yeah. had eating disorders yeah. because also there was so much pressure on them to be a certain weight and to be super fit. Yeah. If you're, if you're, if you're rowing for, for a team, so there was even more pressure on those girls. So, you know, there, there must have been several hundred emetophobes in Cambridge alone at the time. And I think I probably saw most of them at one time or another. Yeah. So I think so. I think though those three things together, me first experiencing it of knowing someone, and unintentionally but gently over time helping her to to overcome that, and then advertising the fact, letting other people know that you know we can work with the metaphobes, and then suddenly being inundated. I think that those three things together, you know, started that ball rolling. And then, and then when I created the Thrive program about uh, 13, 14 years ago now, we used the main Thrive program manual with the metaphobes for the first couple of years. But what we found was because there's quite often a really strong desire for control there, what they tended to do. understandably was kind of cheat the program and would skip all the bits they thought weren't important and would go straight to the what they like perceived to be the solution at yeah. the back of the book right you know yeah. yeah so high is their anxiety and and their, and their stress levels and their will and their want to overcome it they didn't want to do it in the way that they needed to do it they'd skip to the end so i wrote an emetophobia specific manual really only to make it much harder for them to try and skip areas of the program. Gotcha, gotcha. Really, and then obviously, so it's, with much the it's, it's coming. It's much sorry, better. Were they, were how... they coming into the um, the main program when it was just uh, the the Rob Kelly method back then to yes. overcome their metaphobia before an emetophobia program specifically existed? Oh, years years before. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Year, years before. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, um. You know. And and. 
you know, I, I saw several hundred, if not, I would say three or four hundred before I even wrote the first the first Thrive book. You know, uh, emetophobes were the majority of people that I'd seen probably before I even wrote the first Thrive program. And do you think that that's all down to the fact that you were a very uh, uh, rare individual specifically advertising that you treated a metaphobia because there literally wouldn't have been really any, I think so. anything else? I, th I think so. I, th I think it was just, and the fact I was in what, you know, one of, if not the biggest university town in the UK, probably with the largest proportion of emetophobes on my doorstep. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I also, ha I also knew a lot of the local councillors and I knew some of the local college councillors and it wouldn't have taken long and, you know, and local school teachers, local GPs. So, uh, and, and as you know, they have very little, if any, options for sufferers of metaphobia and they were very very happy to yeah. refer people on because they couldn't do anything um I, th I think just you know I, I would like to think that it was my amazing skill set and insight but i don't think it was anything to do with that i think i think it was just mm -hmm. I, I i was in the right place at the right time with the right solution yeah and then and and there are sorry carry on carry on Rob. oh sorry i was going to say uh, and then was fortunate enough to you know it, it also happened at this at, at really at the same time as the, uh, this was the birth of the internet really as well at that point that's how old i am joe right I know you've you've never experienced life without the internet, okay? No dinosaur. No. I re I remember I remember having my first email account after having this girlfriend with a metaphobia. So that that's how long ago we're talking. Mm. So so the internet, well, it may have existed, right? But it didn't expect didn't exist for the average person back then and the average person yeah a few geeks had personal computers right to play games and do programming on right but the normal people didn't didn't have a laptop or a computer or anything like that back then so it also happened around about that time that when all that started i was the first person to have a website that had anything on it about emetophobia yeah probably because i was one of the first people to even have a website I had some quite techie friends. I was still young at the time. I was at that age. You know, you're talking 33 years ago or something. 30 years ago when I first started seeing emetophobes. So by the time... Yeah, yeah. By the time the Thrive program... By the time that we created the Thrive program, I had already been using the insight, insights and techniques that were later with, within the Thrive program with my clients for many years before that. You know, the Thrive program didn't just suddenly start existing bang one day. I'd been doing that for 10 or 15 years, certain parts of that. When the manual came out, that was just the first time all of those insights and techniques had been put together in one place. Mm -hmm. Because I, the first manual I wrote, first Thrive program manual I wrote, was the, sorry, that's not true. The first Thrive program kind of procedure specific procedure i wrote was for smoking and that was 10 years before now the thrive program smoking manual was the third manual to come out actually but i'd been doing the thrive program for smoking for 10 years before the thrive program came out so that's how long the thrive program was kind of in existence although as you pointed out it was called the rob kelly method back then um so that's how long you know, I'd been working on that and been working with clients using the vast majority of those techniques within it. And then what we did, we just refined what was in the main Thrive Program manual specifically for emetophobes. Now, the other thing you've got to think about, I was fortunate enough that, of course, it wasn't just me. 
I had lots of other colleagues that I worked with and that I trained. So it wasn't just the number of clients I was seeing that was metaphobes. I had, I had several other colleagues that were also treating metaphobes with my program. And yeah. then when, then when we officially brought out the metaphobia manual, excuse me, um, we had a hundred thrive coaches out there delivering that program. That's why, that's why the thrive program is so big for a metaphobia and so well known. It's not because Rob Kelly saw a lot of people. There are a hundred thrive coaches out there all over the world treating metaphobes with the thrive program. That's why we have so many testimonials. Yeah. That's why we've taken so many people through it. Not me. You know, I've only taken 10% yeah. of those people through. Yeah. And, and from a sort of maybe a bit of a, a self psychology standpoint from yourself, what do you think was the reason why you kind of latched on to a metaphor as such? Do you think it was because of the girlfriend or even the years following the girlfriend, right, as you were starting to develop a very specific emetophobia program. Because if you have a look at the coaches that you have working for you, right, including myself, the ex emetophobes have a very clear sort of view on why they like to look and, and work with a lot of emetophobes, because obviously we can feel very empathetic towards the other metaphobes out there you know we know specifically how it's like what it's like to feel the way that they do hence why you know i i'd, I'd love to look, work with as many metaphobes as possible but from yourself who never had a metaphobia it's quite interesting that you're so specialized in it and wanted to carry on you know being such a, a specialized person within that that field that's a really good question, actually. Um, and I can answer that because there was, an, there was another field that I was specifically interested in as well, which was chronic fatigue, post-viral fatigue syndrome, um, ME, you know, that, 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 that group of non-specific psychoneurological disorders, whatever you want to call them. Because to be honest, when I first brought out the main Thrive Program manual, I'd written that specifically for people with ME, chronic fatigue, post viral fatigue syndrome. That's what that was aimed at. Okay. Yep. And the reason I'd done that is because at the time, that group of people, that group of people with ME, post viral fatigue, chronic fatigue type symptoms and problems, and emetophobes were the hardest people to help. And that was my interest. Okay. Everyone else was comparatively easy to help them get back on track and sort their lives out. I don't mean the really badly affected people or the people that were suicidally depressed, right? But your average person was quite amenable to a positive coaching program to take control of their lives, right? So most other people got better with a little bit of help okay yep people that were particularly difficult to help weren't necessarily the people that were most affected by their symptoms but were definitely the people that were most affected by their beliefs and their thinking styles and that is people that had that were particularly obsessive and brooding and ruminative people that had felt out of control of their emotions for a long period of time. People that had perhaps some lot of black and white thinking people that may have had unhelpful people around them that were trying to be helpful, but were in fact were colluding with them on some level, helping them maintain their symptoms. And the, 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 the psychology of someone back then that had ME, chronic fatigue, post viral fatigue, even things like fibromyalgia to a lesser extent, were very similar to people that have ME. Sorry, people that have um, emetophobia. In as much as we're talking about bright, driven, motivated people 
that are that brood a lot and ruminate they feel powerless about their symptom so people with me chronic fatigue and emetophobia feel more powerless about their symptoms than the average person does now that's understandable right because you know how badly affect you know how you know, shit your life was when you had emetophobia right and it's you know, horrible to have me chronic fatigue particularly and it's made worse so by the fact it's so non-specific and there isn't and wasn't and still isn't a medical reason for it or a medical diagnosis you know in a way it's quite easy when you go to your doctor and says you're right you're depressed bang people kind of understand the nature of being depressed here's a tablet here's something else but they could yep. never say what me was or chronic fatigue was or post viral fatigue was and and couldn't really help because it was so non-specific and the same thing with the metaphobia as you know and, and people most of the people who come to the thrive program have tried i think the average is 5.6 different therapies or treatments before they come to it right so of course they feel pretty helpless and pretty hopeless by the time they even come to us so they uh, metaphobes and these other people share a number of similar thinking styles and beliefs and attitudes and behaviors and at the time i was much more of evangelistic therapist than i than i than i am in my later years in that i specifically wanted to help the people that were hard to help yeah you know and i empathized more i didn't like it i didn't like the fact that people weren't getting help mm -hmm. Sim simple as that you know i don't, I don't like yeah and it, it... i don't like seeing homeless people now okay and 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 i want to help and uh, a metaphor e even now and you know technically i'm retired from seeing clients i will always answer emails from emetophobes and people with me chronic fatigue you know I, w I won't pass them on to somebody else to answer because I know how horrible it is specifically to have one of those symptoms. So I think, I know it's a really long answer, right? But it's a good question because I'd never thought about it. But that that's why yep. it's because they were really difficult to treat. And people that had it, there were really horrible symptoms and problems to have. And even going back years, I had successfully helped many people with those symptoms. And I, I guess I felt also a little bit of duty to find out why, what was it we did with those people that we didn't do with other people that weren't helped. So find out what's working and do more of that and fine tune it until you get something that works all the time or as often as possible. And then create a program out of it to help those people. And that's also yeah. why, Joe, it's also why, why I put it in a, a manual rather than charging £10,000 a day and getting people to come and see me and me now being rich and living in Jamaica or on some beautiful Hawaiian island or something. Because that's what a lot of people do when they find a resolution for a particular problem. They charge an awful lot of money for it and just get rich off it. I wanted to write, I wanted to put everything into a manual and make it as cheap as possible so that all of those people could have access to it. Now, you and I know, you and I have discussions on a weekly basis about how we can make it more accessible to people, how we can get it out there to people that can't afford it, how can we get it out there to people that can't read, what other languages can we translate it into, you know, can we put it online, a better online version to make it easier, accessible, to make it cheaper, you know. Our goal is to get that manual in front of as many emetophobes as we possibly can, and that's because there's really nothing else out there that will help them, and we know that our programme will. Yeah. Yeah, and I think yeah. I think yeah. that and, I, and I, that's, that passion. Yeah, yeah, and and one of the points that I was going to mention as well, just sort of leading off of that, is in from what I've seen, the emetophobes that I've spoken to, and even before I became a coach, and knowing other people, because obviously as an emetophobe, you seek out other emetophobes to make you feel a bit better about the uh, horrible phobia that you're living with, and I've never come across someone truly emetophobic, right? Not just sort of 
living with a bit of a disdain for being unwell or seeing other people being sick, right? But someone that is really emetophobic overcome their emetophobia from the more generic opportunities for help out there um, because there really isn't anything else out there um, that helps, obviously, in my slightly biased opinion, as well as what we've got in front of us. Well, um, it, and it is if, so if it, important. If you look at the res if you look at the research, there's nothing else out there. There's nothing else yeah. out there. I mean, even here in the UK, the the chief person within the NHS that has a, an emetophobia clinic tells their patients and absolutely believes that you can't be cured from emetophobia, and that's the top person within the NHS, the specialised NHS clinic for metaphobia tells their patients, we will try and help you live with your phobia better. Don't get your hopes up. You can't get over it. You're stuck with it for life. Yeah. And, and that's what you're up against. Yeah. And everything else yeah. is, is a shade of grey between that and the throne. And, you know, you of all people know that that's just not true but that makes it difficult yeah. as well because yeah. because if the if the you know if the so-called experts out there are saying that you can't overcome it and as we've already ascertained people feel very powerless about having emetophobia you can understand why a lot of emetophobes don't believe they'll ever get over it you know yeah. uh, i have had people ask me are, are, have we used actors in our 400 odd video testimonials? Have we paid people to pretend that they've overcome emetophobia? That, that's how black and white their beliefs are. That's how powerless they feel. It's easier to believe that we've made this whole thing up about there being a cure for emetophobia than it is to believe they could overcome it. There will be people out yeah. there that yeah. believe you are a stooge, that you are an actor. Yeah. And yeah. that bunkers. Keep it a secret. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what? It's, you know, I would have picked a better actor. No offense. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, the, the drama GPSEs speak for themselves. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> but, but, so that's, that's still, that's still what drives me, as you know, and you, that's still what drives me to want to help them. I cannot be, you know, how long ago do we put a man on the moon? Was it 1950 or 60 or something, right? 40, 50, 60, 60, or, 60 or 70 years ago, we put a man on the moon, right? Here we are 60 or 70 years later, and still there's a massive proportion of people suffering from mental health issues and mental health problems, and particularly really bad ones like emetophobia, and they don't need to be. And how, it, have, having a, I do feel a burden like having a cure for cancer. Imagine if you'd cured, uh, developed, f stumbled upon. I stumbled upon it, right? I didn't sit down one day and think, right, I'm going to invent a cure for emetophobia. I stumbled upon it, right? And I was fortunate enough to have a girlfriend that had it and had lots of clients early on that had it. Thank God for her. Really? Yeah, 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 definitely. And um, it, it, it's un un unconscionable that in this day and age, people should be suffering from mental health problems, particularly really horrible ones like emetophobia and not getting the help they deserve. And I, and, I, and I really feel strongly about the fact that there isn't more help out there for them, which is why, as you know, you and I are so determined to get this out there to as many people as possible. Yeah, because it can be different and You've only got one life and if you're struggling every single day for years on years on years it's not fair no and why would you, why you don't have to put up with it yeah don't have to put up with it and mary yeah. i know we always talk about mary our poster girl you know and, and i think and most metaphobes that know of the fry program have watched mary's got three or four videos i think and most of them have watched mary's videos several times you know, she had 
she hadn't lived her life for 75 years, from age 7 to age 82. One of the worst affected emetophobes I've ever known or heard of or heard from. But she completely cured herself in six or seven weeks. She didn't even see a coach. In fact, that's a lie. I, I, I saw her for one session because she had a problem with um, perfectionism later on. But she cured herself with, with a manual. An 82-year-old cured herself of 75 years of metaphobia. She'd had therapy all through those years. I think even been locked up at one point. But certainly seeing psychiatrists and psychologists and psychoanalysts and different therapists, having all sorts of treatments, none of them helped her at all. She cured herself in six or seven weeks by studying the Thrive Programme manual. And, and I remember to this day, because I got an email off her, I got an email off her, and I remember it. Do you know what? I'll dig it out one day. Hello, my name's Mary. I don't live that far from you. I'm in Essex. I'm 82. I just wanted to say how wonderful, blah, 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 your program is. You know, I've got this little thing with perfectionism. I've just got to overcome this last hurdle. And I thought, how how sweet. And I said to her, look, just keep focusing on what you're doing. Keep pushing it, blah, 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 blah. And, and and if you don't, I'll get in the bloody car and I'll drive down there and I'll make you do it myself. Which is a silly thing to say, because, of course, she said, oh, no, I need your help. So I went down to see her. And that was it. And, and I remember sending her that email. And that's how, that's how I met Mary. And, that, and, and that, that's yeah. it. But if a seven, yeah. you know, if someone that's been suffering really badly for 75 years can completely overcome it anybody can yeah yeah and i and i think that's why we like to talk about mary so much because it really does encapsulate how every emetophobe believes they're the worst emetophobe going ah yeah. oh, joe's over his emetophobia he can't have been as bad as me yeah. you know i'm different you just got to look at mary who spent her entire life in that position and now it's completely different so you know what what more but that, but that, that, they will watch those they will watch those videos joe and they'll think as you just said actually she couldn't have been that bad or maybe she's a stooge or 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 maybe you know maybe she didn't have it as bad as me but that's just about their belief as you know and and, and the metaphobia is all about your beliefs yep yep brilliant okay um unless you've got anything more to add i think that perfectly sums up how you've gone from point A to point B and where we are today, which is, I think, really nice for any new emetophobe coming into it, looking from the outside, how we're, uh, you know, real. <laughs> Hopefully they can believe that. Yeah. The, the, only, the only other thing I would add, again, we are, we are fortunate enough that we have about 100 coaches all over the world helping deliver the program to people that need it, but also hundreds, if not thousands of metaphobes at any given time going through the program with just a manual. And of course, because they all do our online quizzes now, we've got all that data. So we've got millions and millions and millions of lines of data from probably about 25,000 emetophobes now, right? And that data comes into head office every day, okay? And based on that data, and that data is some of their scores before, before and after doing the program, we're able to keep tweaking the program. You know, I have in front of me here a current rewrite of the program. I'm updating the emetophobia program as we speak, tweaking it, adding bits, changing bits, adding new research, so we are continually able to keep making it better and better and better because we've got such a big cohort, because we, at any given time we have hundreds of emetophobes going through the programme that we're getting data and yeah. feedback from. So it's not that we created the emetophobia around 10 years ago and it's just stayed the same. It changes every month, maybe just a tiny bit. Yeah. Big changes going on now that are coming out in the new version of the manual before the end of this year, just making it easier to work through the manual, simplifying it a little bit. Just, we're just tweaking it all the time just to make it a little bit easier to access, a little bit easier to go through. 
finding finding ways of motivating sufferers to work just that little bit harder etc all the time tweaking it to make it as easy as possible for them to get over their phobia yep we couldn't do that we couldn't do that if we were only seeing one client every couple of months we've literally got yep. hundreds going through at any any day so we've got what no one else has got which is a tremendous amount of data on people going through the program before and after and how they're finding the program, how much they're changing, which of their beliefs are easiest to change, which are hardest, which are their thinking styles, how their attitude changes, how their behavior changes, how their beliefs change. You know, what's the hardest part of the program to challenge, you know, uh, what's the most difficult concepts and beliefs them to get their head round. So because we've got so many people in a way, it's a godsend for us because we've got so much information that will help that continually helps us tweak and improve the program. Yep. Yep. Yeah. You know, with the best will in the world, the, 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 you know, the busiest, even at my busiest time when I was still a therapist and I was seeing lots of clients, I was probably only seeing 10 emetophobes at any given time. We got hundreds going through today alone. And if you could uh, get your girlfriend over it 20 odd years ago without all of this research, then uh, look at it now. It was, it was nearer 30 years ago. I know I look young still, but it was <laughs> nearer 30 years ago. Yeah. But yeah a, 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 you know, you, I've said it before. It's my absolute belief that anybody can overcome their emetophobia and be completely free from it with our program. Yeah, definitely. Amazing. Okay. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, Very welcome. Nice yeah, to see you. Hope you enjoy everyone that's listening in.